As we gather to remember and to celebrate the life of Perry, we are reminded by the psalmist that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Listen to these words of Jesus when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Today, we claim that promise of Jesus for Perry. Grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As we gather to celebrate and remember Perry's life, we're also here to acknowledge our grief and our loss. And may God grant us grace that in the midst of pain, we would find comfort that in sorrow, we would find hope. That in death, we would celebrate resurrection. For in dying on the cross, Christ destroyed death. In rising from the dead, Christ restored life. We celebrate that through faith in Jesus Christ, Perry was sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's child forever. Gary Gabriels is going to lead us with his ministry of music.
How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things he has done with his blood. Save me with his power, he has raised me to God. Be the glory for the things he has done. Just let me live my life, let it be pleasing, Lord, to thee. And if I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me to God. Please pray with me. God, we give thanks that you are a God of compassion and a God of mercy. We know that when we grieve, that you grieve with us. Be near us in our time of grief and by your spirit speak to us through your word. Give us the ability to celebrate Perry's life in the knowledge that he has gone to be with you and that for him, life continues in a, a better place and in a better way. Remind us of your love for us. And thank you for the opportunity to come to you in our time of need. Draw us close to you and help us to be an encouragement to one another. Hear our prayer as we offer it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Psalm 34, 18 has been very special to the family. And uh, we have a video, a, a peppy video of that song. Perry liked peppy songs, and we're going to show that video at this time. The Lord is close to the broken hearted and saves those who are crushed. In spirit, the Lord is close to the broken heart and the Psalms 34, 18. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
18. I'd also like to share a few passages of Scripture which remind us of God's love for us, of his promises to us as well. First from John 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him. These words of Jesus uh, from John chapter 14, just prior to his leaving the earth. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be also where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. These words of the apostle Paul to the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 4. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who fall asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the voice of the archangel and with a loud command and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And these words from John's Revelation, Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Perry was a count your blessings kind of guy, and for that reason, we're going to sing that hymn, Count Your Blessings, it's number 563 in the green hymnal that you will find in the rack in front of you. 563, count your blessings.
Cindy and her children wrote some letters and memories in those letters, and um, most of them I will be sharing with you. Cindy wrote this. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want, but the realization of how much you already have. That's an anonymous quote. Forty years together just wasn't long enough. We had so many plans of adventures in travels, home improvement projects, and many more memories to be made with our family. I was kind of envious of your contentment. You truly knew the magic of an ordinary day. I was always looking to the next great adventure, but you found satisfaction, peace, and joy in all things simple. Work, time with family, feeding the birds, and just enjoying the beauty of nature. You were generous with your time, your talents, and your love. You lived your faith and showed love, not with words, but by your actions. You were a true servant. You had more than your share of health issues and surgeries, but you always treated recovery as a challenge. Perhaps a stubborn Dutchman? I said that many times, at times as an insult and at other times as a compliment. God knew the difficult health road you would walk, and he gave you the strength you'd need to live it. You went to many quaint bed and breakfasts, foreign travel, endless history walks, endless history walks on every trip to Disney six times, and you hate heat and crowds. You did this for us when you would have rather been fishing on a quiet lake. In my grief, I keep thinking of how much we lost, losing you so suddenly and too soon. But I can hear you reminding me to stop and look how, I'm, how much I still have. Count your blessings. And then she sent this additional note this morning. Here's, here it is. It's difficult and yet so fitting that today is Valentine's Day. Two weeks ago, on another cold and snowy Sunday, I plugged in my coffee maker only to find it no longer worked. My morning routine and comfort of slowly enjoying my warm coffee was not going to happen. About it. But I had no intention of driving to get a new one that day because of the weather. For whatever reason, that day Perry said he would drive me to get a new one. I said I could wait until the next day, but he assured me he was fine driving, even if we had no idea what the road conditions were. Perry was not a shopper, unless it was Fleet Farm, Danny Hardware, Menards, or Home Depot. So he just dropped me off at Target. When I got back in the Jeep, he said, Happy Valentine's Day. To which I replied with some sarcasm, I'm a lucky woman. I wasn't lucky. I was blessed. He knew me best. I had no need or desire for jewelry. He often surprised me with the gifts he gave because it showed he was listening and remembered when I mentioned things or pointed out something I liked but wouldn't spend the money on myself. We were not fancy or flowery. We had many ups and downs because our personalities and our temperaments were so different. He loved big in a quiet way with his actions. All those little things look so big right now. Love you forever, Pear. Just put these thoughts and memories. When he walked into the room, the rest of us disappeared. Opa, Opa's home. All the grandkids would yell excitedly as they ran to greet him. 
We all like to pretend our feelings were hurt, but we were really just as excited to see him as they were. These last few days have been excruciating when we forget for a second as when we hear the door open, hoping it is you. We keep hoping that this was just a nightmare because it can't be true. We turn to God because if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, 2 Timothy 2.13. This was my anchor verse a little less than a year ago when you had heart surgery. And I need to hold on to this promise because I can't do this on my own. My dad exemplified love as a verb. During every difficult moment, even ones brought on from my own poor decisions, my dad has always been there. His love was unconditional, filled with fun, and made us all more brave. And as watching him with Jaylee as he taught her how to swim, ride her bike, multiply, and as she helped him in the backyard and his workshop are memories that I will cherish forever. He was the best dad and opa. Our hearts are broken because he was so amazing and we miss him. We will love and remember you every day, Dad. Jen is going to read some memories that she has. Dad, these last few days without you, I felt like we lost our atlas, our GPS, our roadmap to show us how to do all the things. But now, after being able to clear the initial shock, anger, and desperation from my mind, I have realized that little by little, you have given us all the directions. You've just let go of the seat of the bike, and now we have to ride on without you hanging on. Romans 12.10 says, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. That was my dad. He taught me to love in action for every birthday, every game, every performance, every big step in life for any of us, every random time we invited him over, my dad was there with his little smirk. Dad taught me to listen to hear what the person is saying, not to listen to respond. He taught me I'm never too good for something. Ask me about the Walton Mobile sometime. He taught me to love by doing for others. He knew, I knew, he hated Pinterest. But you better believe he did every single project I asked him to help me with. And by help, I mean he did all the hard work and I just did the finishing touches. He showed us every day how much he loved us, whether it was with all my projects, moving our belongings across the country, redoing the bathroom for mom, picking out the perfect bike for the kids, building a swing set on the hottest day of the year, building a step on the hottest day of another year, spending hours routering verses into the wood slices for my wedding, braiding my hair every night so I could have the perfect crimp, C coming over to fix yet another problem, playing Candyland with a five-year-old who hates to lose, folding paper airplane after paper airplane for Jaylee, Deacon, and Vander, or perusing the aisles of Fleet Farm for something he knew the boys would love. He showed us how much he loved us all. I love you and miss you. Thank you for jumping a curb for me. Jared's memories. Oops, I better take this off. It's hard to think of continuing on without you. But I know you will always be with us. 
all of the lessons you have taught me about being the best husband and father I can be are countless. I just hope I can make you proud. Everywhere I look and think back about, you are there being an awesome dad. I love you so much, and I am forever thankful for the time we had with you. Jay Lee shared these memories. I will pray and pray and pray for you, Opa. Remember that time where you told me I was your squirt. Well, you're my Opie, and I love you more than anything in this world. God, help me to see why this happened to our family, why this happened to me, because Opa is my favorite person to be with. But even though this has happened, I know you have a plan for my family. And I know you and Opa are looking down at us right now. I am very sad, but I will remain faithful. So I am going to enter this challenge because I know Opa is in heaven with you and you are going to help me through these years. That's for sure. Vander, I still love you, Opa. And Deacon, I wish Opa could have stayed a little longer. Tammy and Bill Pfeiffer shared a few thoughts. Being a man of few words, when he did speak, you listened. When you did speak, you listened because it was usually something thoughtful. He had a way of interacting without speaking. He would stand behind my chair and chomp on ice or a carrot stick because he knew he would get a reaction from me. Then he would smirk and laugh. Bill will miss his random texts of a picture of an old junker car and say he thinks he could get a really good deal for it if he wanted it, or a billboard he found amusing. I will think of him fondly while enjoying a lemon cookie gelato at the creamery in Sister Bay or hear a bird chirping. Just about two years ago, Father's Day 2019, um, Perry's children and grandchildren put together a little book called What We Love About Dad and Opa by your kids and grandkids. And it's one of those little books that starts out with, I love you, and then ends with something else. I would like to share with you a few of their thoughts from that little booklet. I love your love for your kids and grandkids, Jenny. We always have the best time when we are moving stuff, Jared. I'm impressed by your work ethic, Jess. Thanks for encouraging me to do basketball, Jaylee. I love how you never get tired of my home improvement projects, or at least pretend not to, Jenny. I learn to be a good husband because of you, Jared. I admire your dedication to our family, Jess. If I had to describe you in one word, it would be fun, Jaylee. I like your hugs, Vander. You'll keep playing forever, won't you, Deacon? Sometimes your ability to fix anything amazes me, Jenny. I love that you taught me to appreciate 
a day fishing even if you didn't catch anything. Jared, I love the way you joke, laugh, and smile when you play with your grandkids. Jess, I love how you always are silly. Jaylee, I'll always be grateful that, quote, Opa will fix it. Vander, if you were a car, you'd be a milk truck deacon. I have a few other memories I was able uh, to glean from the family the last few days that I would just like to pass along to you. Uh, Perry was very much a the hands-on parent with their kids and their grandkids. He taught his children how to tie their shoes, how to ride a bike. He taught Jaylee how to braid her hair. He would go on field trips with his kids and his grandkids. And he coached his children's ball teams. He even started a flag football league in Newsburg, so Jared would have other teams to compete against. He could often be found down on the floor playing with his kids and his grandkids. Perry was one of those guys who wouldn't give up when he was working on a project. He, he would always find a way to do it. And he and Jared, who oftentimes worked together, had a saying that when one of them was struggling to do something that they couldn't do, they would say, if you can't do it, I will. Perry was a handyman. In his younger years, he would buy cars that weren't in great shape and fix them up and sell them. His family affectionately called him MacGyver for his many inventions. He made a swing set from, from scrap lumber. He made a, a wand and a box that some of you might have seen displayed that he made for Jaylee because she liked Harry Potter. He made the table decorations that you see down here, those slabs of wood for Eric and Jen's wedding reception. He had a very creative mind, and as they said, he could fix anything. His family affectionately called him the king of concoctions. He, for example, had his own recipe for trail mix and had some special beverage concoctions, non-alcoholic, that he would also put together. Perry could be a, a bit of a prankster, he recently wrote on Wayne and Alice's calendar at their home that they had an appointment, an appointment that they didn't really have. <laughs> and he knew that Alice didn't like mice, so he would hide a fake mouse someplace just to startle her and get a reaction out of her. Perry could be uh, rather particular about some things. He didn't like rattles or squeaks or those unwanted noises in his vehicles. So he would do whatever it took to silence that unwanted noise. He had a certain brand of ketchup, Heinz ketchup, that he would buy. Even had a certain kind of toilet paper that was the only kind to buy. And once when Cindy forgot to put his spoon in his lunch pail, he wrote a note, leave spoon in my lunch pail. Perry liked to be prepared. He would leave for work early just in case he would have an issue with his vehicle so that he would make sure that he still arrived on time. Uh, speaking of on time, Perry's motto was, if you were on time, you were late. He would even carry a, a spare set of wiper blades. That's how he liked to be prepared. Perry didn't need a lot to be content. For example, when he went fishing, he didn't have to catch fish in order for the trip 
to be a success. He was also very considerate of others. He would do things because he knew that someone else liked it. For example, the six trips to Disney World, even though he didn't like the heat. Perry showed his love by doing. Whether it was doing something that wasn't his first choice, or when he was working on some project for someone, he showed his love by doing. As a member of our church family, he served faithfully. He served as a deacon, as a pastoral care elder, as a youth leader, and most recently, he was part of our video camera team. Perry's good deeds demonstrated his servant heart. And for all those good deeds, he will be missed, and for many others as well. As you heard all those memories, you realize there was a lot of different things that could go into a little time of reflection and meditation on God's Word. A lot of characteristics that could be thought about and talked about. But when we were sitting down with the family, a verse that quickly came out of Cindy's mouth, based on even the letter that she shared with us, was from Colossians 3, verses 23 to 24 where it says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as you are working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. As I reflected on those verses, I came across some other verses from 1 Timothy 6 that brought in a word that you've heard quite a few times this afternoon. Here are these words from 1 Timothy 6. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understanding nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicion, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And the words that came most to me out of this and that what was shared by the family was that of content. Being content. What does it mean to be content? content. What does it look like when you think about being content? I began to think of definitions and images in my own mind of what it would mean to be content. What do I picture? What do I think of when I think of content? I began to think about our dog, as he lays on the floor sometimes in the sun, all stretched out, and you wonder if he's still there. You know, he's just so still, so relaxed, sleeping so soundly that nothing will disturb. He's just so content. Or maybe you're a cat person, and you're sitting there, and you hear that cat just purring away, purring away. Content. Then I found this picture. Now, that's contentment, right? Right? Here's a lion laying with impala right there, right? For both of them. I mean, this is their number one source of food, and yet they're just standing there like nothing's going on, and the lion's just laying there, contented as can be, content. There's nothing else they need, just willing to be there, in a sense, 
with peace. And it was this image of contentment that was rolling through my head, and then I saw the picture you chose for the obituary, and I saw it again. I look at that face, and I see contentment. That smirk, I think that was referred to, that smile with his eyes and his whole face of a man who was content, happy with his life, satisfied with what he had. It's this contentment that Paul is trying to teach Timothy about. He's trying to teach him about this, that he may communicate this very important thing to the leaders of his church, that they might understand in order to lead, one needs to have this kind of belief and foundation in their life of contentment. It's a beautiful gift, a powerful gift, because we as human beings are so quickly led astray by things, right? I mean, we invent things to make our lives easier, and then we get so caught up in them, I wonder sometimes if the solutions that they've created are worth the problems they've also created. I wonder that about my cell phone on a regular basis, right? We get so caught up in chasing after things that these things become more important than what really, truly matters. And in this case, Paul uses the example of money. He doesn't say that money is evil. He doesn't say it's the worst thing in the world, that it's a source of all bad things. He says that the love of money is a root of all kinds of of evil. In other words, when you chase after it, when you make it something that you live for, it can lead you down all kinds of bad paths. Think of what it does. And this is just one example of anything that we want to turn into something that we love first in our lives. Unless that something is God, that's what he's telling them. For those who don't think about this teaching of Jesus Christ and godly living, they're missing out on this grand blessing that comes of contentment, of knowing what truly matters, of knowing what truly is a source of joy and of life and of meaning in our lives. See, one thing that Paul wants Timothy to understand and the leaders of that church to understand is that God who's created us has given us life and he's also shown us in the living of that life how much we mean to him by giving us his son Jesus Christ giving of himself completely to us that we might know the extent of his love for us that we might understand the beauty of this gospel teaching. And that's really what Paul is referring to when he talks about the teaching of Jesus and this life of godliness. It's this relationship with Jesus Christ because all those rules and laws to live by, that's all stuff that flows out of first and foremost. Knowing who God is and his great love he has for us in Jesus Christ and what he would go to to make sure we would understand that love. And that was the extent he would go to. And when we understand that, we understand what truly matters, right? Because when we chase after the other things, we realize there comes a day when those other things don't matter anymore. Money, stuff, all those things, they disappear and they're gone. But the memories, the experiences, the offering of your gifts, your life to others, to God, that lasts forever. That stays with people. Perry understood this. That's how he could have this profound contentment. How he could know that, you know, I don't really need much, and yet 
he would turn around and say, but I have so much at the same time. Because he understood that these things were a gift of God in this gift of his life. He understood what it meant to realize that he had been given a life that he could use in so many different ways. No wonder MacGyver, as he's known as, could look around him and see the many things at his disposal right there to make gifts for his family, to spend time with them, to do things for friends and people who needed some help. He knew what it meant to make full use of the resources he'd been given and enjoy that as he could by using it for others, doing it for others, and and seeing the joy in that and watching them smile, watching them laugh, even maybe watching them jump when they find that mouse somewhere hidden in the house or hear that ice being chomped on behind them. They would know that was Perry's way of enjoying them and who they were by getting on his hands and knees with his grandkids and playing to enjoy that time with them, to know that they might know how much he loved them and cared for them. This contentment, a beautiful gift out of his knowledge of a loving God who showed him what truly mattered. And I would say in his life we gain a couple of simple principles that come to us out of this gift of God. Jesus often taught, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow is troubles of its own. Live in today. Live in the present. Enjoy what you have right in front of you. Seize the moment that is given to you with family and friends. Take the time to spend with them, to do the extra things for them. Enjoy the work you're given to do. He would never begrudge a day of having to walk out the door to go to do a job he enjoyed to do because it was his job, his way of giving back, his way of serving, his way of enjoying his life. He seemed to be able to make note of all the little things in that. In the ordinary day, I think is the way Cindy put it. Just in the the simple day that we might sometimes get bored with, he'd just be able to make note of how that was special. And that the ordinary things were beautiful gifts. As a fisherman, I fully identify with his ability to lose track of time on the water and to find that kind of love of reflecting, of enjoying. I think that taking time doing those things helped him reflect on his life and helped him count his blessings because he could look around him and watch the birds fly by, listen to him sing, listen to the quietness, if that makes sense, the calmness of the water, and hear the rhythm of peaceful life. He can enjoy all that and enjoy fishing without catching a fish, even though Cindy would give him a hard time asking if he was really even out fishing because he never came back with a fish, or hardly ever at least. Because it was a way to take time to count his blessings to remind himself that, you know what, I don't need to compare myself to anyone else. What they have is what they have, and that's great. I've got so much. I'm so blessed. The stuff, well, it's just what I have in order to use to be a blessing to others. That was his way of being grateful, thankful for what he had. And this is the contented life. This is what it means to be content, to live in the present, to take time to reflect on our lives and to give thanks for this gift that God has given us of life. And so as we gather today 
to worship a God who's given us so much, who's given us fully of himself and his son, Jesus Christ. We come thankful for that gift and how much it impacted Perry. And that Perry would probably be looking at us today saying, you know what? Stop making all this fuss. Stop making all this fuss. Seize the moment of your life today. Enjoy it. Give thanks in it. And love your God and your family and your friends with every resource you have. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us go to God together in prayer. O oh God, from the dawn of the first day, you have cared for your people. By your hand, we were created, and in your hand we live and move and have our being. And to your hand we return again. You have revealed yourself to us in many ways, yet in the fullness of time. Your word, your promises, was made flesh and came and lived among us in Jesus Christ our Lord. And in his life and death and resurrection, we find our calling in this world and our hope for the world to come. We find our contentment. We give you thanks, O oh God, for your servants, who having lived this life in faith, will live it eternally with you. We especially thank you today for Perry, for the gift of his life, for the grace you have given him, for all in him that was good and kind and faithful. And though too short his life, it was full. We give you thanks for that contentment we can see in his smirk and his smile and in his eyes, for his ability to recognize his blessings and utilize those blessings as a gift an ability to serve, for that sense of humor of his, for his faithful love of family and friends, and his enjoyment of life and work, his example of faith. We thank you, O oh God, that for Perry, death is past. Pain is ended, and he has entered the joy that you have prepared for him, that you have made especially for him as that eternal craftsman. You've prepared it in all the company of the saints for him. Now give us faith to look beyond touch and sight and in seeing that we are surrounded by him and so many other great witnesses, enable us to run with perseverance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Oh God, we come praying for his family. Oh God, be with Cindy and the kids and the grandkids. Surround them with your peace and your comfort. For his siblings, for his cousins and uncles and all of them, oh God, just may they know your peace, your love upholding them. May their memories, which may times bring tears and other times may bring a laugh or a smile, or when they think of the jokes he might play on them, may all these things bring healing and hope, the hope that is only found in Jesus Christ to their hearts and their minds. And bring us all, O oh God, to that hope that we might recognize the great gift you've given us as you bring us toward your eternal peace that is only found in Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, in whose name we are so bold to pray. Amen.
At this time, we'll have the song, Death Was Arrested. without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom you faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Oh, shit. 
Amen. Please be seated. As we recognize this great victory we have in Jesus Christ, we hear these words of promise, of hope, of that place we look forward to from the book of Revelation. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing through the fr- from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the red- river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their heads, and there will be no more night. They will need no more light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. It is in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God, our brother Perry. We commit his body to the elements, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, says the Spirit. They rest from their labors and their works. Follow them. Let us pray. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Perry Hoytink. Acknowledge, we pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints of light. Almighty God, by the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, you destroyed death, and by his rest, In the tomb, you sanctified the graves of the saints, and by his glorious resurrection, you brought life and immortality to light. Receive, we pray, our thanks for that victory over death, which Jesus obtained for us and for all who rest in him. Keep us in eternal fellowship with you, who wait for you on earth, and with all who surround you in heaven in union with Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. On behalf of the family, we'd like to thank everyone for coming today and for all the signs and gestures and words of comfort and encouragement and support uh, has been so appreciated in this difficult time. As you go forth from this place, hear these words of blessing now. May the God of peace, who brought from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do his will, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all of God's people said, amen.